This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 2, for broadcast on the 6th of January, 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audioboom, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, mysterious fast radio bursts linked to a distant dwarf galaxy and maybe even a magnetar. NASA announces two new missions to explore the early solar system. And dark matter pioneer astronomer Vera Rubin passes away at 88. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are a step closer to finally determining what mysterious powerful energy blasts known as fast radio bursts really are. A report in the journal Nature, and in two companion papers to appear in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, claims scientists have finally narrowed down the likely source of fast radio bursts to a distant ancient dwarf galaxy some 3 billion light-years away, and possibly also to a highly magnetic type of neutron star known as a magnetar. Fast radio bursts are extremely rare high-energy transient radio pulses which are very brief, lasting just 1 to 5 milliseconds. These extremely bright broadband flashes appear to come from sources far beyond our Milky Way galaxy. And they're very rare. Only 18 fast radio bursts have ever been detected. The first was discovered back in 2007 by astronomers scouring through archival data from the Parkes CSIRO radio telescope in search of new pulsars. Fast radio bursts usually only ever occur once, leading most astronomers to think they're related to the death of an object such as a massive star in a supernova. However, there's one exception to this rule. An apparent fast radio burst, first discovered in 2012, does appear to repeat, the only one to ever do so. This first ever repeating fast radio burst, named FRB 121102, was discovered in the constellation Arejo in November 2012 by the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. It provided astronomers with a unique opportunity to monitor the area of the sky it appeared to originate from, using both the Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico as well as the Arecibo dish in Puerto Rico, in hopes of pinpointing its location. Using high-speed data recording and real-time analysis software, astronomers were able to detect a total of nine bursts over a period of just one month, sufficient to locate it to within a tenth of an arc second. Subsequently, larger European and American radio interferometer arrays pinpointed the burst to within one hundredth of an arc second. That's a region of the sky only about a hundred light years in diameter. Deep imaging of that region using the Gemini North Telescope in Hawaii turned up an optically faint dwarf galaxy, which the VLA subsequently discovered also continuously emits low-level radio waves. That's typical of a galaxy with an AGN, or active galactic nuclei, which is indicative of a feeding supermassive central black hole. This galaxy also has a low abundance of elements other than hydrogen and helium, suggestive of a galaxy that formed during the universe's early to middle ages. The origin of a fast radio burst in this type of galaxy suggests a connection with other energetic events that occur in similar dwarf galaxies. You see, extremely bright exploding stars called superluminous supernovae, along with long gamma-ray bursts, also occur in these same type of galaxies. And both of these have in the past been hypothesized to be associated with massive, highly magnetic and rapidly rotating neutron stars known as magnetars. Neutron stars are the dense, compact cores created in supernova explosions of very massive stars. We mostly see them as pulsars, blinking on and off like rotating lighthouses, emitting periodic radio pulses as they spin. One of the study's authors, Casey Law from the University of California, Berkeley, claims all these threads point to the idea that in this environment, something generates these magnetars. Law speculates that it could all be created by a superluminous supernova or alternatively a long gamma-ray burst. And then later on, as it evolves and its rotation starts to slow down a bit, it produces these fast radio bursts, as well as continuous radio emission powered by that spin-down. 
As it continues to evolve, it takes on the appearance of one of the magnetars we see in our own galaxy, which have extremely strong magnetic fields but rotate more like an ordinary pulsar. While Law has his pet hypothesis about the origins of these fast radio bursts, that is a magnetar surrounded by either material ejected by a supernova explosion or material ejected by the resulting pulsar, there are still lots of other very plausible possibilities. One alternative is the galaxy's active galactic nuclei, with the radio emissions coming from jets of material emitted by the region surrounding the supermassive black hole. The point is, the source of this fast radio burst lies within 100 light years of a continuous radio emission from the core of the galaxy, and that's suggestive that they could have either the same source or at least are physically associated with each other. In other words, we're talking about energy being emitted by a supermassive black hole. And of course the other point is this is the only fast radio burst ever seen to repeat. And that could either mean that we're talking about a different species of FRB, or we're talking about something else altogether different. Whatever fast radio bursts do turn out to be, this is the first time that scientists have been able to show this to be a cosmological phenomenon, and not something likely to occur in our cosmic backyard. The objective now, of course, is to figure out exactly what's really happening, and why. NASA selected two missions designed to open new windows in one of the earliest eras in the history of our solar system, a time less than 10 million years after the birth of our Sun, 4.6 billion years ago. The missions, known as Lucy and Psyche, will fly in 2021 and 2023 respectively. Lucy will visit the swarms of Trojan asteroids orbiting the Sun around Jupiter, while Psyche will study a unique metal main belt asteroid that's never been visited before. Lucy is scheduled to launch in October 2021 and is slated to arrive at its first destination, a main belt asteroid, in 2025. Then, from 2027 to 2033, Lucy will explore six Jupiter Trojan asteroids. These asteroids are trapped by Jupiter's gravity into two swarms that share the planet's orbit, one leading and one trailing Jupiter as it completes its 12 year circuit around the Sun. The Trojans are thought to be relics of a much earlier era in the history of our solar system and may have formed far beyond Jupiter's current orbit. Principal investigator for the Lucy mission, Harold Levison from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says it's a unique opportunity because Trojans are remnants of the primordial material that form the outer planets, and thus they hold vital clues to deciphering the very history of the solar system. Like the East African Australopithecus hominid remains after which it's named, Lucy will revolutionise science's understanding of the solar system's origins. The spacecraft will build on the success of NASA's New Horizons mission to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, as well as the recently launched OSIRIS-REx mission to the asteroid Bennu, using both some of the scientists from the two missions, as well as newer versions of the same science instruments deployed on both spacecraft. Meanwhile, the Psyche mission will explore one of the most intriguing targets in the main asteroid belt, a giant metal asteroid known as 16 Psyche, which is about three times further away from the Sun than the Earth. The asteroid measures some 210 kilometres in diameter. And unlike most other asteroids that are rocky or icy bodies, 16 Psyche is thought to be composed mostly of metallic iron and nickel, similar to the Earth's core. In fact, scientists suspect that Psyche could well be the exposed core of an early planet that could have been as large as Mars, but which lost its rocky mantle and crust due to violent collisions in the early solar system billions of years ago. The mission will help scientists better understand how planets and other bodies separated into their layers, including cores, mantles and crusts, early in their histories. Psych Principal Investigator Lindy Elkins-Tanton from Arizona State University says the mission provides scientists with an opportunity to explore a new type of world, one that's neither rocky nor icy, but made of metal. In fact, 16 Psyche's the only known object of this kind in the solar system, and the only way humans are ever likely to visit a planetary core. Psyche's targeted to launch in October of 2023, arriving at the asteroid in 2030, following an Earth gravity assist manoeuvre in 2024 and a Mars flyby in 2025. NASA's planetary science director Jim Green describes both Lucy and Psyche as true missions of discovery on how the solar system formed and evolved. Lucy will observe primitive remnants from further out in the solar system, while Psyche will directly observe the interior of a planetary body. These additional pieces of the puzzle will help scientists better understand how the Sun and its family of planets formed and evolved over time. 
NASA's other missions to asteroids began with the Near Orbiter, which arrived at the asteroid Eros in the year 2000, and continues with the Dawn mission, which achieved orbit insertion around the main belt asteroid Vesta in 2011, before moving on to the dwarf planet Ceres, where it's now orbiting. Then there's the OSIRIS-REx mission, which launched in September of 2016, and is now speeding towards a 2018 rendezvous with the asteroid Bennu, where it will conduct a sample return mission, bringing back to Earth a chunk of the asteroid in 2023. Each of these NASA missions focuses on a different aspect of asteroid science to give researchers a broader picture of our solar system's formation and evolution. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. NASA's NEOWISE mission has discovered another two previously unknown near-Earth objects or NEOs heading for our celestial neighbourhood, including one which further blurs the lines between asteroids and comets. An object called 2016 WF9 was detected by the NEOWISE project in an orbit that takes it on a scenic tour of our solar system. At its furthest distance from the Sun, it approaches Jupiter's orbit. Over the course of 4.9 Earth years, it travels inwards, passing under the main asteroid belt and the orbit of Mars, until it swings just inside Earth's own orbit. After that, it heads back towards Jupiter in the outer solar system. Objects in these types of orbits have multiple possible origins, but the most likely is that they were once comets, although they could also have simply strayed from the dark population of objects in the main asteroid belt. 2016 WF9 will make its closest approach to Earth's orbit on February the 25th, passing some 51 million kilometres from Earth. If 2016 WF9 turns out to be a comet, it'll be the 10th discovered since the NEOWISE mission's reactivation. On the other hand, if it turns out to be an asteroid, it'd be the 100th discovered since reactivation. NEOWISE is the asteroid and comet hunting portion of the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, mission. After discovering more than 34,000 asteroids during its original mission, NEOWISE was brought out of hibernation in 2013 to find and learn more about the asteroids and comets which could pose a threat to life on Earth. What NEOWISE scientists do know is that 2016 WF9 is relatively large, up to a kilometre in diameter. It's also rather dark, reflecting only a few percent of all the light that falls on its surface. Now that means this body resembles a comet, its reflectivity and its orbit, but it appears to lack the characteristic dust and gas cloud that normally defines a comet. Deputy Principal Investigator James Bauer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says WF9 could have cometary origins. He believes it illustrates that the boundary between asteroids and comets is a blurry one. Perhaps over time, this object's lost the majority of the volatiles that linger on or just under its surface, and which, as it gets closer to the sun, would generate the coma and spectacular tail so customary of comets. Meanwhile, another new object discovered by NEOWISE is more clearly a comet, releasing heaps of gas and dust as it nears the sun. Paul Chodas from NASA's Center for Near-Earth Object Studies at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory says the comet, named C2016U1 Neowise, has a good chance of becoming visible through binoculars. As seen from the Northern Hemisphere during the first week of 2017, comet C2016U1 Neowise will be in the southeastern portion of the sky shortly before dawn. It's moving further south each day and will reach its closest point to the Sun inside the orbit of Mercury on January the 14th before heading back to the outer reaches of the solar system on an orbit lasting thousands of years. That'll take it out beyond Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, well into the Oort cloud and interstellar space. Near-Earth objects absorb most of the light that falls on them and they then re-emit that as energy in infrared wavelengths. This enables NEOWISE's infrared detectors to study both dark and light-coloured NEOs with nearly equal clarity and sensitivity. And that's important because many of these objects are extremely dark in colour. They're like charcoal or freshly laid asphalt on a road. NEOWISE data has been used to measure the size of each near-Earth object it observes. More than 30 asteroids that NEOWISE has so far discovered are known to pass within 20 lunar distances of Earth's orbit, and 19 are more than 140 metres wide, yet reflect less than 10% of the sunlight falling on them, making them extremely dark to see without spacecraft like NEOWISE. I'm Stuart Gary, you're listening to Space Time.
One of the great pioneers of dark matter, astronomer Vera Rubin, has passed away aged 88. Rubin's pioneering research, measuring galactic rotation curves, proved beyond doubt there was something fundamentally wrong with science's understanding of the physics of the universe. Either there was a serious flaw in the laws of gravity as we know them, or there was a great deal of unseen mass out there, needed to explain the observations of the apparent movement of galaxies in clusters. Thanks to Vera Rubin, we now know that 27% of the universe is made up of a mysterious invisible substance we now call dark matter. But just as importantly, she helped open up the male-dominated field of astronomy to women. Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory and Andrew Dunkley are looking at Vera Rubin's massive scientific legacy. She was one of the great names of astronomy. It's mostly astronomers who know of Vera Rubin's work. But if you say dark matter to many people in the street, not everybody, but a lot of people, they would know what you're talking about, something that we know exists in the universe, but we don't know what it is. Mm. Vera Rubin is the person who she didn't discover dark matter, but she probably did more than anybody to put it on the map in terms of the fact that there is something out there that we don't understand. So Vera, a lifelong astronomer born in 1928 with parents of fairly humble backgrounds and certainly not uh, particularly scientific. Her father was an electrical engineer, but she went to university. She was devoted to astronomy for her whole life. She actually was refused entry to the University of Princeton. This was on the grounds that she was actually not a male. Uh, she was. Uh, she attempted to enrol at Princeton, but women weren't allowed into the graduate astronomy program. It's just you know, it's just a, a look back to a, an era where. Uh, everything was different. And that really gave Vera the other string to her bow. She spent a lifetime being a passionate advocate for women in science. And, you know, you can understand with a background like that, that she would be driven very much to try and change things as she became more and more senior mm. in the world of science. She did do a master's degree at Cornell University and eventually her PhD, which she did, in fact, at Georgetown University. But that Princeton turned down or not back, it stung her and stayed with her. Um, It's perhaps a reflection on the way that things did transpire in her life that she actually died in Princeton because she was working there for a lot of her life. Um, Why is she important? Back in the mid-1970s, Vera was observing galaxies, these huge aggregations of hundreds of billions of stars and gas and dust and realized that they were spinning too quickly, that these galaxies, if all you could see was all that was there, they should be flying apart. So she recognized that that probably meant there was something more whose gravity was holding them together, something that we couldn't see. Uh, Actually, Andrew, this had been pointed out before Vera's time. In fact, the discovery that really initiated the whole quest for dark matter was made in 1933, a long, long time ago, by a man called Fritz Zwicky. He was a Swiss-American astronomer who actually uh, figured out that galaxy clusters that he was observing should have flown apart billions of years ago if there was nothing more than what he could see holding them together. Yeah. So he flagged that there was a problem, but nobody took that issue up. And then in 1970, an Australian astronomer, who I know well, Ken Freeman from the Australian National University, he flagged that there was a problem as well because he saw that galaxies seemed to be rotating more quickly than they should be. But it was only when Vera Rubin made her observations, and perhaps it was because she was American, perhaps it was because she was a woman astronomer, it's unusual back in the mid-1970s, but perhaps for whatever reasons, that was when the astronomical community really started taking this idea seriously, that there was something wrong with our understanding of the cosmos and that there must be something out there that was controlling the universe in a way that actually we still don't understand. We understand that it's due to gravity, but we don't know what the material is that is providing that gravitational force. On the heels of Vera's discovery, she basically, in many ways, initiated the search for dark matter. And during the 1980s, there were two theories, the the theory of machos, which were, of course, acronyms. uh, Sorry, the two theories were acronyms, machos and wimps. Machos were massive compact halo objects. Wimps were weakly interacting massive particles. (laughs) 
Um, Machos were very quickly ruled out. What they were supposed to be was dead black holes or, you know, orphan planets or defunct stars, things that didn't have any illumination of their own. But they were very quickly ruled out in the 1990s, actually by work again done at Mount Stromlo in Canberra. Mm. And so now we believe that what dark matter is, is a species of subatomic particle whose nature is unknown. The best guess is something called a neutralino, but we don't know whether neutralinos exist or not. And so the baton really for trying to discover what dark matter is all about has passed to the Large Hadron Collider and similar facilities where these particles are being investigated. Obviously, she has done some significant work and achieved great things in her life. Is there a process that guarantees that her work won't just fade away into nothingness and all that knowledge and understanding lost? How, how does the astronomical world maintain what has been achieved by someone like Vera Rubin? That, yeah, that's a great question, Andrew. And in in fact, that happens in many ways almost automatically because the data and the measurements and the deductions that she brought to astronomy are all enshrined in the astronomical literature, which is a kind of uh, it's a repository of knowledge, and it includes all the major journals, the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Astrophysical Journal, Nature. All these major journals are really um, part of an archive that has been built up actually since the Enlightenment, because some of those journals go back to the 1670s. Mm. And they contain all that knowledge and information. And so the measure of a scientist's success in many ways is how often the, their papers are cited. And citation indexes are now very much a modern trend for saying how well you're doing as a scientist. There is one addition to that, though, that I might suggest, and that is that Vera, for many years, was regarded as a likely candidate for a Nobel Prize because the dark matter stuff is of such importance. She was never awarded one. She may well have been nominated for one. I don't know. I don't have insights into that, but she was was never awarded the Nobel Prize. And I think a lot of astronomers think that is probably rather unfair. Perhaps it was because the dark matter problem had been flagged before Vera came along. She was the person who really forced people to take notice of it. As we were saying at the beginning, sadly, she died. She was ripe old age of 88, and her loss is mourned throughout the world of science and astronomy. Indeed, but uh, her legacy will live on for many, many years, and uh, who knows where that might lead. And, uh, you know, she, she's um, certainly done some amazing work that will not uh, not be wasted by the sound of it. Indeed. That's Dr. Fred Watson and Andrew Dunkley from our sister podcast, Space Nuts. And just like Space Time, you can check out their podcast at Bytes.com or your usual podcatcher app. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. One of the world's most advanced military telecommunication satellites has been successfully launched into orbit. The 8th US Air Force Wideband Global SATCOM System Satellite, WGS-8, blasted into black skies from Space Launch Complex 37B at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. Status check. Go Delta. Go WGS-8. 25. Greenboard. Light lock in. SRM TVC blowdown. 15. Profi ignition. T-10. 9. 8. 7. Six, five, four, we have engine ignition, two, one, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the WGS-8 mission for the United States Air Force. used a Boeing Delta IV rocket using a single common core first stage fitted with the new upgraded RS-68A liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fueled cryogenic engine together with four GM-60 strap-on solid rocket boosters. RS-68 continuing to perform well. Chamber pressures and injector pressures looking good. Burn profiles on the four solid rocket motors also looking good. Now passing one minute into flight. Approximately 30 seconds remaining in the solid rocket motor burn. Delta IV is now... Twelve nautical miles in altitude, ten miles downrange, traveling at two thousand miles per hour. 
One minute, 20 seconds in. Standing by for SRM burnout short. The first pair of solid rocket boosters were expended 92 seconds after launch, followed a second and a half later by the remaining two. And we have solid rocket motor burnout. Standing by for separation. The spent boosters were then jettisoned in pairs 100 seconds after launch, followed by the protective payload fairing 95 seconds later. And we have good indication of separation of all four solid rocket motors. The Delta IV rocket now weighs just half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of almost 2,000 pounds per second. The upper stage AC Yes, press valve has been opened. Two minutes into flight, now passing Mach 5. Delta 4 is now 40 miles in altitude, 55 miles downrange, traveling at over 4,000 miles per hour. RS-68 continuing to perform well. Fuel injector and chamber pressure is looking good. Vehicle body rates remaining stable. Two minutes, 40 seconds in, and the upper stage engine has begun the LOX pre-start sequence. One minute to Miko. Three minutes into the flight, now passing Mach 10. RS-68 continuing to perform well. Fuel injector and chamber pressures look good. Standing by for payload fairing jettison momentarily. And we have indication of payload fairing jettison. The rocket's core stage continued powering the spacecraft for another 40 seconds until Miko managed and cut off. The vehicle is now 80 nautical miles in altitude, 190 miles downrange distance, traveling at 8,900 miles per hour. Three minutes, 40 seconds into flight. Standing by for booster throttle down shortly in preparation for Miko. And booster has begun to throttle down in preparation for Miko as expected. Standing by for Miko. And we have Miko, first stage engine cutoff, standing by for separation. Six seconds later, the core stage was jettisoned, and the upper stage's single RL-10B liquid-fueled engine ignited for a 15-minute, 37-second burn, bringing the spacecraft into orbit. And we have good indication of stage separation. Heads is deploying, standing by for main engine start. And we have main engine start on the upper stage engine. Chamber pressures and injector pressures look good. This is the first of three planned burns for today's mission. First burn should last approximately 15 minutes and 30 seconds. The flight then underwent a 9 minute 37 second coasting phase before the upper stage engine was reignited for a second burn, this one lasting 3 minutes and 7 seconds to lift the spacecraft into its satellite transfer orbit. Following satellite deployment above and to the east of Madagascar, a third engine burn was undertaken to deorbit the upper stage and sent it back into the atmosphere where it burned up. The 5,987-kilogram WGS-8 satellite is based on a Boeing BSS-702HP bus capable of data processing at 11 gigabytes per second and fitted with 10 KA band and 8 X band transponder spot beams plus a full Earth footprint. Each of the $426 million satellites are equipped with a Xeon ion propulsion system as well as conventional hydrazine engines carrying enough fuel for a 14-year lifespan. When complete, the 10th satellite constellation will provide the Pentagon and its allies with secure military communications from geosynchronous orbit. This flight was the 114th mission for the Boeing Lockheed Martin United Launch Alliance partnership and the 34th flight of the Delta IV rocket. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary.